Uh, thanks, Antonio. Um, so we'll just get ready to uh, start with our first talk. Um, so um, as I was mentioning earlier, um, my colleague Dr Lima Robert is, uh, many of you will know her from um, all the work she does across cardiovascular genetics across the whole of London and internationally. Um, she's a fond of um, lots of knowledge and what we're starting to see is even though uh, we thought that aortopathies previously were sort of a different cohort of patients, we're starting to see that there are some overlaps with uh, some cardiomyopathies and this is an interesting area. Um, and hopefully some of the things that we'll bring out in, in the course of this afternoon's uh, talks and uh, one of the cases will highlight some of the difficulties that we're starting to see with patients who perhaps span uh, both areas. Um, so uh, Lima, are you ready to speak? Uh, yes, I'm um, sorry, I'm a bit nasal. I've got a bit of a cold. Um, can you see my slides? <coughs> um, uh, we can. Not yes. quite yet. Antonio, you can, is that right? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So I'm That's just fine. going to move this up there so that it stays out of the way a little bit. So shall I start, do you think? Uh, yes, yes, please do. Okay, so I'm going to touch on iotopathies and I'm not expecting all of you at the end of the session to become an expert in actually um, uh, identifying whether it's a syndromic or non-syndromic iotopathy, but just to give you a flavor of what this means and when you should be considering uh, referring on to the geneticist um, for uh, appropriate uh, clinical assessment. Um, so just a bit of background. I'm hoping this will move forward. I've been having major issues with my laptop, so please give me a moment. Why is this not moving forward? <laughs> Lima, if you prefer, I can run your slides for if you. you. If you can, please, because this is not moving forward for me. Shall I stop sharing? That's yeah, if you could, and then I'll just I'll just add to them. Perfect. Thank you, Andrea. I thought I'd just worked it out, but it doesn't seem to be. Hopefully, can you see those? Yes, I can. Yeah. <clears throat> you want to put it on the slideshow view and we can get started? Yeah, I'm just trying. Okay. There we go. Perfect. OK, so if we move on to the next slide, Andrea. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just going to give you a little bit of a background on um, what we say, um, what we mean when we say iotopathy. So this is the thoracic iota, and Andrea, if you click on to the next slide, we are focusing mainly on the thoracic, and we are not going into the di um, into the abdominal, which is below the diaphragm. Um, and um, essentially, with the thoracic iota, uh, when there are um, uh, when it is dilated slightly above two standard diameters, we call it as dilatation. Um, and it, when it is uh, more than three standard diameters, uh, we call it an aneurysm. This is just more for us um, in terms of how we measure and how we monitor as well. Um, and as you can see from the pictures that I've put up there, the, uh, the dilatation can involve several different parts of the aorta. Next slide for me, please. Um, what is more important is that the aortic aneurysm or dilatation is often asymptomatic. So you do not have any symptoms with related with this condition and you often only uh, pick it up as an incidental diagnosis or if you go looking for it because there is a family history. Aortic dissection on the other hand is lethal um, and there are different types of aortic dissection and I'm not going to go into this in more detail but it can be type 1 or type B and both of them can be seen in individuals with both uh, syndromic and non-syndromic aortopathy as well. Next slide for me, please. So these are some slightly old figures, um, but I just wanted to highlight this to you. If you look at abdominal aortic aneurysms, um, that is the incidence that we've got there, and we've got uh, quite big chunks of them as, um, as uh, smoking and um, uh, lipids, as in um, cholesterol, as one of the uh, reasons for um, um, having um, the wear and tear kind of changes in abdominal aortic aneurysm. But if you look at hypertension, uh, sorry, if you look at aortic dissection, hypertension is often one of the risk factors for um, 
uh, for uh, dissection. But if you look at thoracic aortic aneurysms, we do not often um, uh, have uh, um, risk factors that are easily identifiable um, as an explanation for people who present with this condition. Next slide, please. <coughs> so, Andrea, it's a series of texts, so if you go through them, age and atherosclerosis is um, the main um, issue here. But we also, um, once we take that out of the picture, then we have to consider syndromic ones, such as uh, Marfan syndrome and Lois Leach syndrome, and another click, please. <laughs> and this group of disorders is called as heritable thoracic aortic disorders, and it can be divided into syndromic and non-syndromic. Um, next click for me, please, um, Andrea. Thank you. Um, this is old um, data again, but I think it is still applicable for us. Um, the data is slightly different because it's around 30% rather than 20% that I've put on the slide there. Um, of all non-syndromic, that is people who do not have any other associated features with thoracic aortic aneurysm, actually have a family history of, um, uh, of um, somebody who is affected as well if you go looking for it. So autosomal dominant inheritance with variable penetrance is what we think is the most possible, um, most likely explanation in this group of disorders. Um, and there's some interesting data from the US database, the IRAD database. And if you see um, in less than 40 year olds, 7% of them have thoracic aortic um, uh, disease. And in most of them, it is usually because of a syndromic condition when compared to people who are more than 40 years who present with um, thoracic aortic aneurysm. So younger onset presentation is often indicative of a genetic aortopathy, if that makes sense. Next slide for me. Um, so it's a series of clicks. So if you go through them for me, Andrea. So when we identified that it is a thoracic aortic aneurysm, um, what we then um, start, uh, start to kind of think about is, is this uh, syndromic or if it is non-syndromic? Um, and the pictures that you've got there, the syndromic one is somebody who is um, uh, quite tall with long, uh, uh, long, um, uh, um, uh, long hands and long feet um, and um, very typical of Marfan syndrome. And the non-syndromic, um, you may recognize him. John Ritter was a, a famous TV personality um, in the US who suddenly dropped dead um, and because he had um, an aortic dissection and a family history of several people with the same condition as well. Next um, slide for me, please. So just coming back to what we mean by syndrome, um, a syndrome is actually a group of um, features that we recognize in a person um, and we give it a name. So the doctor who's described it often gets a name and Marfan um, syndrome is one such condition was that was described to people who are tall and thin with long fingers, long toes, um, who have slight um, disproportion uh, between their um, trunk and um, legs, as well as having um, additional features such as an aortic um, aneurysm in, in addition to having lens dislocation as well. Um, was described and, there, and, the, um, and the name was given as Marfan syndrome. So syndrome basically is a collection of features um, which we, um, which is recognized as a pattern. Next slide for me. Um, so I'd like you to focus on this slide a little bit. Um, when we talk about heritable thoracic aortic diseases, um, we currently group them into three categories. One is the extracellular matrix uh, disorders. The other is the TGF beta vasculopathies. And the other, uh, the next one is the smooth muscle contractile vasculopathy. Um, so if you think about the extracellular matrix, um, it often involves um, uh, COL3 and FBN1, which actually works in the TGF beta pathway, but are actually um, um, uh, part of the extracellular matrix uh, group of disorders here. The TGF beta vasculopathies includes all the Lois Dietz um, syndromes um, that have been described. And the smooth muscle contractile vasculopathy involves the non-syndromic um, or the people without the unusual um, um, clinical features, but actually have a family history. Next slide for me. If I go through the first bit, which is the extracellular matrix briefly, next slide for me. Most of you will probably recognize this uh, collection of photographs um, if you have seen them um, during your medical school or training. Um, so you have a pectus there, you have skin striae, you have got a high arched palate, you have got lens dislocation, a positive wrist and thumb sign, 
quite long fingers and toes as well. So this is typical of someone who has Marfan syndrome and you have three systems involved, the musculoskeletal system, uh, which is the muscle, skin and bones, and you've got the eyes involved and the heart with an aortic aneurysm as well. The next slide for me, please. So the next um, group of disorders in this category, which is the extracellular matrix, is vascular EDS. Um, and um, click a few more times for me, Andrea. Um, and people usually have um, uh, quite typical facial features with this condition, as you can see in the photograph there. They have decreased subcutaneous fat, um, uh, premature aged appearance, um, uh, of, which is sometimes called as acrogenia as well. Uh, they have thin translucent skin with arterial intestine and uterine fragility um, or rupture in these cases. Um, so the gene that's involved in this condition is called 3A1. It's quite rare, but it's important diagnosis to make because there is a quite significant um, uh, complications associated with this condition. Um, uh, and it is um, presents um, uh, quite often in young adults. Um, and it's important to um, think about how we recognize this condition and um, treat them or manage them. Next, but, uh, next slide for me, thank you. Um, so the next group of disorders is the TGF beta vasculopathy disorders, and I'll just go through a few things there. Again, I'm not expecting you to make a diagnosis of all these um, conditions, but to recognize some of these features and raise the question, is uh, a referral to genetics actually appropriate? Next slide for me, please. <clears throat> so the first group of disorders that were, um, that were um, described um, was the Lois Dietz syndrome type 1 and type 2 involving the TGF beta receptor 1 and 2 genes. And as you can see, people here, uh, there were two groups of um, individuals identified. One is um, individuals who had quite unusual facial features with wide, uh, widely spaced eyes, um, who had um, a prim a premature fusion of the uh, skull bones with craniosynostosis, stenostosis, who had hand and feet abnormalities with talipes, as you can see there, and who also had a cleft palate or bifid uvula. So that's the first group that was identified. And the second group, which is very similar to vascular EDS or to the um, with thin and tr uh, translucent skin, having um, some lack of um, uh, subcutaneous tissue, um, and and some overlap with the other group that was that was described, which is widely spaced eyes as well. So this group um, was the first one that was described by both Dr. Bart Lois and Dr. Hal Dietz, um, and therefore it got the name of Lois Dietz syndrome um, uh, given to it. Uh, but following this, next slide for me, there were several other uh, types of Lois Dietz actually described as well. Um, so this was the uh, this group of disorders which is associated with uh, TGFB2 was described both by Dr. Bart Lois and Dr. Diana Milovich's team at the same time. And as you can see, there is some overlap um, with uh, the um, Lois Deed syndrome, where there is the slightly white spaced eyes, a very small chin. There was also uh, bifidula associated with this condition. Um, but mainly um, in this group of disorders, um, it was um, the aortic aneurysm, uh, which was quite um, typical um, and sometimes even without the uh, classical features that you would see. Um, so uh, this group was decided, it was um, identified based on this first individual that you can see the slightly older gentleman who actually had um, learning difficulties, and therefore they did some more detailed um, uh, genetic testing called array CGH um, and identified a small deletion which involved the DGFP2 gene. Next slide for me, please. Um, and this group of disorders again is a type of Lois Dietz syndrome, but is also described as um, aneurysm osteoarthritis syndrome because one of the things that was described in this condition, in addition to having some features suggestive of um, uh, Lois Deed syndrome facially and the fiduvula and the aortopathy. There was also early onset arthritis specifically involving um, the knees, uh, the, um, uh, the hand, uh, the carpal bones, as well as the spine, and therefore was given the name of osteoarthritis um, aneurysmal or aneurysmal osteoarthritis syndrome. Um, it's also sometimes described as Lois Deed syndrome type 3 as well. Um, next uh, slide for me, please. 
Um, and another group of disorders which was identified, it's an interesting story because the, the child who you see here um, was actually um, uh, researched by um, her parents, her father specifically, who was a geneticist. Um, he had seen several doctors um, for um, an explanation, didn't find one and um, uh, worked with Judith Hall, um, uh, one of the um, geneticists in, in Canada and US um, and um, identified the spelling mistake in her, um, which was the explanation for um, her. Um, and this is PGF beta 3. This is a condition that's associated with more musculoskeletal features that are associated with um, uh, Lois Dietz syndrome. And the iotopathy is actually um, uh, um, slightly um, uh, reduced penetrance, if that's the right way of saying, because it's actually presents at a much more later stage um, in most individuals. Next slide for me, please. So uh, one of the things to highlight with TGF beta vasculopathies is that it involves the whole of the iota, not just the aortic root or the arch or the ascending iota. It can also involve the small um, and medium sized arteries as well. So it's important to image um, the whole iota. Um, um, and what we do in our um, team is neck to pelvis imaging specifically um, uh, to look for um, uh, arterial involvement. Next paragraph. Next slide, please. Um, and, and next slide again. And so moving on to the non-syndromic one, and I'm just going to describe a few. Um, and as you can see, there are no unusual features present in these individuals. Most of them were identified because of family history. And one of the things to mention in this group of disorders, which is actor two, and I think we'll be discussing a case with this, is that they present with um, thoracic aortic aneurysm, premature coronary artery disease, ischemic um, strokes, but also may have bicuspid aortic valve and PDA and um, eye features uh, with iris flocculi and levodo reticularis as well. Um, so although this was described like that in the um, in the beginning, now that we've seen um, a lot more cases with the actor too, not every every everyone with this condition actually presents with all these features as we see in most um, syndromic conditions. Um, next paragraph, please. Sorry, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, and the um, next one is the MYH11 gene that was um, described again. This also had an association with PDA. Um, and again, it was uh, just because we they went through families that they were uh, and did linkage that they were able to identify this gene. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, one more um, similar uh, presentation is the MYLK um, gene that was identified with a large family. Um, and um, again, as you can see, apart from families, uh, family members having iotopathy, there's nothing else that was described in this group of disorders. Um, next slide. And the last one that I'm going to uh, touch upon is the PRKAG2, but it's one specific mutation in the, in this gene called the PRK, PRKG1 gene, sorry, not two. Um, and that actually causes, um, was the explanation for aortic aneurysm and aortic dissections in this group, um, uh, in this large family studied. Next slide, please. So um, I've just put in this because it's an interesting, um, uh, you know, um, picture to show you the number of genes and how they all interact together. Um, uh, and um, there are still probably more, for, uh, more genes that are being described in this pathway um, that are involved in iotopathies. Next slide, please. If I talk briefly about pathophysiology and I'll touch base again on, on the same thing, it is the upregulation of TGF beta 1, which is thought to be the reason for why um, uh, people have um, an iotopathy. Next slide, please. Um, and again, I want you to, although it's a busy slide, I don't want you to go through everything. You have to keep in mind, it's again the ECM remodeling that happens, that's extracellular matrix remodeling that happens, which then is associated with um, an increased TGF beta um, one um, upregulation, uh, which then um, also um, involves disorganized smooth muscle cells. All of these actually cause thoracic aortic aneurysm formation. That is the pathophysiology that. Um, um, that helps us in identifying how um, these genes all work together. Next paragraph. Uh, next slide, please. So when coming to genetic testing, it is literally like trying to find a missing apostrophe, as you see there. So um, if you click through a couple of times, Andrea. 
Um, so what we need to do is actually uh, select the right book. We have to do careful proofreading, find out the spelling mistake, and then um, one more click, and then um, that's the diagnosis that we try and get in individuals. Next slide, please. Um, so from uh, from a, from the cardiology perspective, if the patient presents there to the cardiologist or to the cardiac surgeon, you find a diagnosis of an aortic root aneurysm or an aortic dissection patient. You just ask about a family history, see if that patient looks unusual. If it is a young onset presentation, then then um, refer on to genetics. And Andrea, there is a few more clicks there, I think. So. As a geneticist, what I would do is actually um, examine the patient, go through the family history, so click again, um, and then consider what, um, click again, and what is the right diagnosis um, for this patient and consider genetics, click again. Um, so that's just to say, this is what we try and achieve in one um, clinic appointment for that patient. So we do everything on all we um, expect that um, from our referrers is for the question to be raised and refer on to us um, for appropriate assessment. Next slide, please. Um, so when, when it comes to Marfan syndrome, and again, it's uh, clicking a couple of times, Andrea, um, often um, the question of do we really need a genetic diagnosis because the clinical features are quite clear, we really don't need a, di a genetic diagnosis there. Um, so, but genetic testing may be important in actually testing other family members and considering um, reproductive options for the individual. Next slide, please. Um, if we click through a couple more times, whereas in thoracic aortic aneurysm, um, we go through the family history and genetic diagnosis perhaps is a little bit more necessary because that will help us identify risk factoring, risk, um, risk in, um, sorry, at risk individuals in that family um, and offer them appropriate screening. A couple more clicks, please, Andrea. So um, a couple a couple more clicks, please. Um, one of the things to say is um, over the period of time that we have been looking after these individuals, although some of the syndromic ones have clear musculoskeletal features, which are typical um, and um, syndromic features, which make us recognize them. Uh, we also know that some of these uh, syndromic conditions also present without any of the other clinical features and just as an iodine as well, which confuses us sometimes. A genetic diagnosis sometimes helps in um, these individuals um, uh, if we consider genetic testing for them. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, a couple more clicks, please, for me, Andrea. So um, one of the things, reasons for considering genetic uh, uh, testing is uh, specifically because of gene tailored management as well. Um, individuals with FBN1, we um, do recommend surgery for them by the time they get to around 50 millimeters of their aortic root um, um, uh, measurements called three or vascular EDS. We sometimes um, have to think about um, whether surgery is appropriate and um, whether um, considering starting them on uh, medication is going to help them in the long run. And TGF beta, sometimes surgery is recommended when they are around 40 to 50, um, uh, 45 to 50 uh, millimeters of, um, uh, di of diameter a in terms of aortic root measurements. And also certain type of drugs are thought to be much more um, appropriate in this group of disorders. But with heritable thoracic um, aneurysm, as in with the non-syndromic type, there are no such explanations currently available. And so trying to differentiate them and look, uh, look into them further might help us in the future. Next slide, please. So I'm ending this by saying proper phenotyping is important for us. Next slide. Um, the common scenarios that we see um, in clinic, um, which I've just outlined there, Next slide. And what we do is a workup of a detailed family history, a three generation pedigree, looking for syndromic features in these individuals, assessing and screening the first degree family relatives, gathering all the evidence to confirm the family history, which is quite important because um, a sudden death may not um, always be related to an iotopathy, and it's important to get that information. Next slide, please. 
Um, and then um, uh, arrange for um, investigations such as an MRA, an ECHO and um, ECG, as well as uh, liaise with the cardiology team. Um, in my case, it's Dr. Yasu Emanuel with regards to appropriate medical management. Um, and then um, also consider screening for first degree relatives. Next slide, please. And then genetic testing also is undertaken for this individual when they come to clinic um, and we um, hopefully we'll be able to um, help them um, with, uh, with an answer, uh, especially um, if um, the genetic test identifies a mutation um, uh, in those individuals. So these were the main things that I wanted to touch upon today. Um, and next slide, I think it says any questions. Um, I'll stop there. I think the medical management and surgical management is going to be discussed by colleagues after me. Uh, thank you, Lima. That was a fantastic overview. Um, I've certainly learned a hell of a lot from you working with you over the last several years. And um, what I seem to feel more and more is the more you see, the less you feel you understand in terms of how the genotype and phenotype correlations match. And I think that's something that we 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 see more and more is um, you know that we see we see the classical kind of syndromes. But the more and more patients that you see, the more you realise that it's really important to try and characterise this whole population to understand how to interpret interpret the genotype and phenotype correlations for the risk stratification, and um, particularly when we're thinking about thresholds for surgery and family screening, um, that understanding is really important. And I think that's something that's evolving rapidly. Um, but um, it's, it's great to have somebody like you who has such wide breadth of knowledge um, to help us, uh, to help guide us through that. Um, I'm just looking to see now in terms of the questions. Um, great, there's somebody, something from uh, Jun Cheong. Um, ah, right, biotic yeah, aneurysm, like all the intervention is based on absolute dimensions. Why aren't indexing being used? Um, okay, um, so, so that is, yeah, go for it. Yeah, so. I was, I was going to say, I think that's something that perhaps um, we can maybe leave until we come to the surgical talk as well. But also, I think we don't use index diameter so much in adult patients simply because the evidence base. Um, has not yet built up to know whether the, the whether indexing the thresholds actually is the right thing to do. So whilst our surgical teams will take into account, um, so say particularly for patients with Turner syndrome or, or who are very small stature, we might think about it. Um, in general, it's something that we discuss on an individual case by case basis with our surgical team as to what we think the final thresholds would be for an individual patient. And the reason we haven't got a unified guideline approach in terms of indexing is just the lack of formalised evidence. And it's difficult to get formalised evidence to, to define a threshold to base a guideline on. It's a much more kind of um, practical decision that you would make as um, an individual team as part of the MDT process. And, and most of the literature as well is also based on um, individual um, you know, diameters rather than indexed ones, uh, yeah, which yeah. makes it difficult for us to actually gather evidence as well. Uh, so I'm just looking to see, um, for some reason, the chat's not coming up on my screen easily. Um, I don't know what's about my team settings. Um, Antonio, are you able to see more of the chat questions. Uh, unfortunately, this is a little bit difficult. Yep, uh, I think we've covered everything for now. Oh, OK, OK, Great. thanks everyone. Um, and hopefully if there are more questions. I am there for the whole session, so I will catch. Um, uh, I will answer on the chat if necessary. Great, thank you. Uh, <laughs> thanks for that fantastic overview.